today. We're going to talk about the entire history of Israel in one song. And it's part one. Okay. So the psalm we're going to be taking a look at today is going to wrap up pretty well Israel's entire history in just one chapter. It does a pretty good job of summarizing from the time of Moses to the time of David. So if you have your Bible, um, we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 78 in this lesson. So you might want to take notes in your own Bible or cross-references. One, one theme in this lesson uh, to remember is this truth that we so often hear. Those who do not learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat the same mistakes. Right, we know that we hear it all the time. Those who do not learn the lessons from history are doomed to repeat the same mistakes. Now there's, there's so much that we can learn in today's day and age in the church from Israel and the history of the Israelites. Certainly we know that the whole Old Testament is said to be written for our learning. Uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 that we might come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Right? Galatians 3.24 tells us that the Old Testament was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And once we're there, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. So, Psalm chapter 78, we're going to talk about today, covers a very wide span of time in, in these 72 verses. So that's why there's uh, a part two, because I couldn't cover 72 verses in, in one lesson. But what's interesting is that in Scripture that God often, he'll, he'll zoom into a story for a very close-up look to take some lessons from it. You know, take the book of Genesis, for example. When you read the first 11 chapters of the whole book of Genesis, it covers a time frame of history of 200, or 2,500 2, years, like 2,500. But then when you look through chapter 12 to chapter 50, all through the end of the book, it zooms in on that 300 years uh, in the book of Genesis. So the, you know, the outline at that point is very simple of the book of Genesis. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And, and so, you know, God gives us a big, wide-angle view of the creation and the history of, of how the world began. It's a book of beginnings. And then he starts to zoom in for a close-up look on this family line. And, you know, the whole Old Testament really is a history of their descendants that comes from, from Abraham. And, of course, we know Jacob, that his name was changed to what? Israel. Israel. Right? And so those who descended from him were known as the children of Jacob or the children of Israel. So the whole Old Testament, that's really what we're looking at, is the descendants of this family line to bring us to Christ. So today we're going to focus on one psalm. It's Psalm chapter 78. And what it teaches us uh, about the history of Israel and God's interaction with them uh, through the, throughout the ages. So there's really some good application for us today. The author of this Psalm 78, his, his name was Asaph. You can read of Asaph in the Chronicles. He was a musician and a songwriter of the day. Many of the Psalms you can read of, you always think about David writing the song, but he wrote quite a few in, in the Psalms. And he did live during the time. Of David. This uh, Psalm 78 would be classified as an instructional psalm. It would also be a historical psalm, a messianic psalm we'll see at the end probably next week when we look at part two, and also a wisdom psalm. So this whole chapter fits into many different categories. It's an impressive piece of writing, really. So uh, as we begin with verse one, I'd like to make point number one of our lesson. Point number one is that the history of Israel is a history of divine revelation. That God spoke and gave his words through these people. Verse 1 says, Asaph writes, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Well, that's a good attention getter, right? Asaph starts by saying, Incline your ears. What's incline mean? Right, we know what recline means. We do that when we go home this afternoon. We, we, we relax. But to incline means to you know, move forward. You don't want to miss what I have to say. And incline your ears to the words of my mouth. And as a reminder to us all, God's mind was revealed through words written down by inspired men. That's how he worked. Okay? Jeremiah chapter 1, in verse 9, God said, Behold, I put my words... In thy mouth. Right, Jeremiah is the one who spoke them, but they were really 
with God's word, right? It's in 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 2, David said, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was in my tongue. Or, yeah, it was in my tongue. You know, so the, the words that we're reading of Asaph certainly <coughs> fall into the same category. Inspired man. So God is the one who's saying, hey, I want you to listen up here. I want you to listen very closely, incline your ears to what we're about to say. So God did this through Israel's history, speaking through these men uh, and women. This, uh, point number two I want to look at. The history of Israel, we're going to see, is a history of parental responsibility to teach. You see that a lot in Israel's history, the emphasis of that. Let's look at verses 2 and following. Asa writes, he says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and know. Well, how did you hear them, and how did you know them? Our fathers have told us. It's passed down from the generations. All right, now what's your job? Verse 4, we will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come, and what is the curriculum? What is the teaching that's to be passed down throughout the generations? Here it is. The praises of the Lord, His strength, and His wonderful works that He has done. And don't forget these things. Pass them on. Uh, verse 5 says, For He established a testimony in Jacob, right there's that family line, and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers, what? That they should make them known to their children. Hold your finger on there, if you're, if you're turning in your Bible. Hold your finger in uh, Psalm 78. Turn over for just a few minutes to Deuteronomy chapter 4. In Moses' uh, series of farewell sermons, I guess you could call it the book of Deuteronomy, listen to the statements that Moses makes on this subject in instructing Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Moses says to Israel, says, only take heed to yourself. And diligently keep yourself. Right? Be diligent in this. Why? Lest you forget. That's an important phrase. Lest you forget. You need to be diligent. Lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen. And lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Especially, verse 10 says, concerning the day uh, you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb. When the Lord said to me, gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my word, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on earth, and that they may teach their children. Right, so you see the progression. Now let's make a pause and say, let, how, how great this country of America could be, how great we could be if every household would follow these instructions. Right, parents to teach the next generation. Don't let God's word go untaught. Don't let the people of this world forget God's mighty works. But let's remind them. Let's keep re reminding the future generation. You know, let, let, let's ask this question. Isn't every parent, I'm not a parent yet, but I'll be there maybe someday. Isn't every parent supposed to be conducting some kind of a homeschool when it comes to spiritual matters? Mm -hmm. Where we sit down with the children and instruct them from God's holy word. I think we forget how powerful this is in this society. You know, parents see their children become teenagers. It happens so fast, they say, in adolescence. And they wonder, why are, why are my children so rebellious? Why don't they care about God's word? Well, partially it's because you didn't take the time to teach them. Right? You know, Sunday morning and, and Wednesday night can only go so far. You know, we need to be instructing as much as we can to pass on to the next generation. There's a story of a woman who was expecting a child. Uh, and she was due in a couple of months. And she was reading her Bible out loud in a room all by herself. Someone walked in and said, why are you reading your Bible out loud? And she said, I'm reading to my son. He said, you know your son can't hear you. He's still in the womb. She said, I know, but it certainly can't hurt if one of my son's first memories is of his mother's voice reading him the Bible. Now, I think that's an attitude that we should all have from the time we're very little. That, 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 how good would that be for our country if that was the instruction in every household across America? So, you know, Moses makes these great statements in Deuteronomy chapter 4. But, you know, have you ever thought your preacher preaches a lot of the same stuff sometimes? 
Or maybe I get up here and you, on a Sunday and you're thinking, Travis, didn't you just recently talk on that subject? But I can only imagine when Moses gets up and speaks two chapters later in Deuteronomy chapter 6 on the same subject, that they're wondering the same thing. Moses, didn't you just talk about this? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. He says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk to them. Now, I'm, I'm talking about when you, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, I want you to be teaching. When you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them with a sign on your hand. What's that all about? When you want to remember something, you write it down, you, you write it on your hand so you don't forget. It's a, it's a note, right? And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, right? Put it right, right there in your face. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates, right? The original post-it note. Anybody out there post, post stuff on their mirror before they go somewhere so they don't forget or put it on their refrigerator? That's what it's talking about. Don't forget these words. But Moses, haven't we already heard you emphasize this point that parents are supposed to teach their children? Why did you just repeat yourself? Deuteronomy chapter 11. Moses, what are you preaching today? Well, among other things, I'm going to be preaching this. Verse 18, Therefore, you shall lay out these words of mine in your heart and your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them. Moses, don't you know any other sermons? Right, why, are you, why are you repeating yourself? What does this teach you and me? Now, if you flash forward uh, hundreds of years to the time Asa's writing, is, is the emphasis any different? Now, he's summing this up in verse 5 of the chapter 78. It says, For he established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed the law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children. The emphasis is still the same. He says that the generation to come, verse 6 in it, might know them. The children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. Now why is God so determined to, to the, the parents teach their children about Him and what He's done and how great He is? And if you look at that, how many generations is that that He's talking about? You know, in verse 5, he, he command, it says he, commands, he commanded our fathers. That's one group. Right, that they should make them known to their children. There's the next group. That the generation to come might know them, even the children that should be born. There's another. That they may arise and declare them to their children. We understand it's passing on. How many of you, just out of curiosity, have something in your possession in your family that was passed down from grandparents, great-grandparents, and beyond? Anybody have that? Well, that, that's, that's, some, that's something very special. When something's passed down to the next generation, it, it's, it's a very priceless thing to us. You can't, money can't put anything on it, right? And we, we're excited when we get to pass it on to our own children and see that stay in the family name. That's exciting. What is the most priceless family treasure that we could pass down to the next generation? It is a knowledge of God and His Word. Right, and a respect for him. We have to teach it. Right? And maybe you don't have kids, but we need to be teaching and instructing and just make sure the world knows you got to remember this stuff. That's the most priceless thing. Why is it so important, verse 7? That they may set their hope in God. That's why we need to teach the next generation. That they, as we have, may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So why? So they don't forget. So we don't forget. Now why, why do we need to talk, talk, talk to our children when we're walking by the way, when we're rising up, so they don't forget? We're forgetful people. Certainly. And as we'll see in the next verse, in verse 8, now, parental instruction isn't just saying the words. It's living the life. It's not just talking the talk, but it's walking the walk. Because why? Well, children watch. Verse 8, why, why teach your children? That they may not be like their fathers. I mean, what, what were most of the daddies and granddads like in Israel? A stubborn and rebellious generation. 
That's what they were like. A generation that did not set its heart right. And those spirits who were not faithful to God. And that's why. That's why we're mourning. Little Johnny was playing with his truck by the stairs in the living room. All of a sudden, little Johnny burst out in a string of profanity and curse words. His mother, of course, heard this and was not pleased at all. And she lectured him, young man, we don't say words like that in this house. Where did you ever hear that? So the giant responded, well, that's what daddy said last week when his truck wouldn't start. Oh, our children are listening to our work. And they're watching us, aren't they? I have another illustration story. These little boys found a stray dog. They wanted to keep it. That ever happened? I think that happened to me a few times with a cat. They thought it was a stray, but it was actually a lost dog. And the signs start going up on the telephone poles around the community, right? Lost dog. And the sign says, has a shiny black coat and three distinctive white hairs around the collar of the neck. And they, you know, they, they, they saw these going up, they knew it wasn't their dog, but they had grown so attached to this dog, they knew it wasn't theirs, but they didn't want to give it up. So they said, Dad, please, you know, please don't make us give up this dog. You know, we love it so much, Daddy, please don't make us give up this dog. And in their presence, their daddy plucked those three white hairs off that dog. So that no one could would be able to argue that it was their dog. Because after all, look at those three distinctive white hairs. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that that act by that father had a lasting potential impact on those children and their degree of ethics and honesty? Yes or no? For sure. Right? You know, where is it that the children and the people of the next generation learn these things from the parents? From us, and, and they, they look up to the older generation. You know, well, let's just say I lost my glasses, even though I broke them, and now the insurance will cover it, or whatever it is. And we'll, we'll come up with a number of things our children are watching. The younger generation, they watch, and if we are rebellious in, in the Word of God and what it says, if we won't adhere to it to do our own willful thing, I know what God's Word says, but I'm going to go over here and do this. Our children are going to know about that. You can, you can say God's words and speak to them as they're walking by the way all you want, but if you're not doing it, actions speak louder than words in this case for sure. And in the case of the history of Israel, unfortunately there was an entire generation like this of stubborn and rebellious people whose heart was not right and who didn't have a steadfastness to love God. In verse 9, it goes on, Asaph mentions the children of Ephraim. They were the tribe, uh, the tribe of Israel located in the northern territories. And you know, we're not told exactly what uh, occurrence in, in Israel's history this is referencing, but there was some occasion okay, in the history of Israel when the children of Ephraim were prepared for battle right, against their enemy. And they were carrying bows and arrows and they had their armor ready. But what happened? What's the verse say? They turned back in the time of battle. They were ready to fight for God and to fight against God's en enemy. But the verse says, The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. Some uh, have thought that maybe Judges chapter 1, verse 29, might be in view here where it says, Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites and dwelt in Gezer among them, right? They were supposed to go in there and drive out those who were, were in this land, and they, they didn't. And so whatever it's talking about, verse, verse 10, teaches us another very important point of Israel's history. Point number three of our lesson, the history of Israel we see as a history of rebellion and refusal. Isn't that what we see? Verse 10 says, they did not keep the covenant of their God. They refused to walk in his law. That's a strong word right there, right? This isn't talking, oh, I just slipped up, I stumbled, I fell. But we see this attitude, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do, God. And in fact, I'm going to do what you said I should not do. So I'm going to live for me. Well, that's rebellion, and unfortunately that was the history of Israel on many occasions. 
But notice next in verse 11, another point, point four, that the history of Israel is a history of forgetfulness of the greatness and goodness of God. And Moses, as we had talked about Deuteronomy, had begged them in his farewell sermons, don't forget, don't forget. Right? Deuteronomy chapter 8 in particular is threaded with that phrase, always remember, never forget, always remember, never forget what they do. They forgot. Verse 11 says, and they forgot his words and his wonders that he had shown them. What, you know, what kind of things are we talking about here? What kind of works did they, did they forget? Well, verse 12 says, marvelous things which he did in their sight, in the sight of their fathers, in the land of Egypt. There's some content. That they were supposed to pass these things on to the next generation so they wouldn't forget, but they forgot. What did he do? Verse 13, he divided the sea. Remember that story. He caused them to pass through the Red Sea. They made the water stand up like a heat. You think you'd ever forget that? Verse 14. In the daytime also, he led them with the cloud. And all night with the, with the light of fire, he, he led them. He split the rocks, verse 15, in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. So what kind of things are we talking about here? You know, it's not necessarily that they forgot in the sense that, oh, I don't remember those things happening. But it's that they did not keep in their minds the significance of all these things as God led them out of Egypt. That, that, and the lessons that, that, that would have taught them about God, that God is not going to forsake us, but they forgot these lessons. They forgot to pass these things on to keep a remembrance for the next generation. Now think about some of the things that he just listed here. Now do you ever think you would forget the significance of what God did in the land of Egypt? Now if you were one of the children of Israel, and you were a witness of the ten plagues, that, that amazing story that God brought upon Egypt, the water to blood, the frogs, and the, the death of the firstborn, the darkness on all the land for those three days. Do you think you'd ever forget those signs from heaven and how God brought you out because of that? No, I mean, if you, if you were one to witness a cloud leading your path as the children of Israel by day and that pillar of fire by night. You know, the Israelites had a GPS. Telling them which way to go. They would follow wherever it went. God was leaving them. And then uh, what happened? They were cornered. They got to the Red Sea. The army of the Egyptians were, were at their back. The Red Sea was at the front. They certainly thought, all hope's lost. Where, what are we going to do now? Where are we going to go? What did God do? I think this is a good lesson. God always provides a way out for his children. It will take it. He always is going to provide a way out. For the faith. You don't have to take it. You don't have to take his way. They could have said, I ain't going in there. That's dangerous. But they walked by through faith. And God was able to save them. So you, you saw these things. And then you know, God parted that Red Sea. And the entire nation of Israel walked through on dry ground. And you witnessed that. Think you'd ever forget it? Now, they, we, sometimes we might think that it was just a little path. And everyone was walking single file down that line. No, I this was talking was talk about hundreds of thousands of people running from this Egyptian army. This was a, this was a big, a big part of the Red Sea. And then the Egyptians, how uh, they perished, right? And we know all these stories. Then they got out into the wilderness. They got into the desert region. The children of Israel needed water. And again, some of them were thinking, God, you brought us out here out of the land of Egypt so we could die of thirst and then we could die. And then you observe that God opens up that rock to Moses. And you watch it. They, they watch it gush out like a river. Psalm chapter 105, verse 41. It says, He opened the rock and water gushed out. This isn't they're walking up there with their little Dixie cups to, to, to get a little drink of water. This is a river. And they didn't have any water. And they ask God, and boom. These are miraculous feats of the Lord back in the day. And God showed them these. You know, I'm going to take care of you. Whatever the case, I'm going to take care of you. He showed them. You would think after all of this that the children of Israel would trust in their God 100%. Whatever he says, I, I know what you've done in the past. I'm going to trust you no matter what. But what you see instead is that God's people forgot. They forgot the significance of his mighty work that he performed for them. 
verse 30, 42 later says, they did not remember his power. I think he's able to, to do these things. But what's verse 17 say? It says, but instead they sinned even more against him. Right? He gave him his law, and, and after all these things, you would think, hey, we're going to obey you now, God, we're going to trust you. But they transgressed his law even more by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. I like that phrase. They wanted the food of their fancy. That they were, they were getting manna from heaven that God was giving them. And they were tired of it, right? They were like, yeah, man, give us something better, God. In verse 19, this is an interesting language. It says, yes, they, they spoke against God and, and said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? But we like some food. We like some better food. Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Right? Can you do that, God? And the children of Israel they sound like the biggest bunch of brats we read in history. Don't you? But many times we're the exact same way. And that brings us to point number five that we can learn about the children of Israel in the history. It is a history of murmuring and complaining. Can we learn something from that? I think so. You know, he, he saved them from how terrible that bondage and we could spend, spend a whole lesson talking about how bad they had it in Egypt. So they forgot about that once they got out into the wilderness. We're hungry and thirsty. God provided them. They weren't satisfied. All they could do was complain. And no wonder that we can read of this response in verse 21 and following. It says, Therefore the Lord heard this and he was furious. Wouldn't you be mad if you were God? You brought them out and you're feeding them and you're giving them drink. You protected them from the army and they're, they're just complaining and murmuring. So the fire was kindled against Jacob. The anger also came up against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. There's another point. Huh? Number six. A history of, the history of Israel is a history of unbelief. In God's way. You know, are we talking about they didn't believe in God? Are we talking about atheism here? That, you know, I, I don't even believe God exists. No, certainly not. We're talking about, I mean, after all these things, they knew God existed. They saw his mighty works. What we're talking about is the children of Israel didn't trust God. They did not believe his words and what he was telling, telling them to promise. They, they, you know, they didn't have confidence that he was able to save them in their situation. So he gave them great and precious promises about this land that they would come into. And how, how often, you know, we, we refer to it as the promised land. And so he gave them his promises, led them by the hand through all this, and they, they still wouldn't trust God's word. They said in their hearts, we, we'd rather not follow your instructions, God. We, we're more com comfortable doing our own thing. I'm not sure that your way is the best way. They didn't believe God. They didn't believe it. Now Hebrews chapter 3 in the New Testament references this generation. Talking to Christians, the Hebrew writer says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Well, what's the rebellion? We're going to learn what he's talking about. For who, he's asking this question, who, having heard, rebelled? Who was it? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? But that's the generation he's talking about. Verse 17 now, with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpse fell in the wilderness? <clears throat> in verse eighteen, and to whom did he swear that he would not that they would not enter into his rest? And who did God say that about? But to those who did not obey. So we we see verse nineteen that they could not enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. They didn't believe God. The history of Israel is one of uh, disobedience and unbelief. They, you know, God's saying, follow me, just do what I say, and you'll be absolutely fine. Just trust me. I tell you to do this, do it. Trust me. Have faith. But Israel didn't believe God. They didn't want to follow his way, and they wouldn't obey. I think this is a good lesson between verses 18 and 19. You know, God asked, who, who was it that I said would not enter into my rest? It was those who did not, what? Obey. Those who didn't obey. But then verse 19 says they couldn't enter in why? Because of unbelief. Do you see the connection between belief and obedience? If you believe what God says, you're going to do it. And many people won't do what God says because they don't trust Him. 
They don't believe it's true. They don't believe the words are true. They won't trust God. The Bible says without faith, without that confidence, it's impossible to please Him. The, the, the Israelites did not have confidence in God for some reason. There are many lessons. We'll, we'll, we'll cut it short there today. Um, we'll start there next week. There are many lessons uh, that spiritual Israel, talk about us, uh, can learn from physical Israel. We in the church need to understand, first of all, our great responsibility to pass God's word on to the next generation. Teach the children, teach the younger people. But secondly, we can uh, learn from Israel's mistakes of rebelling and refusing to submit to what God said. He was protecting them. And they said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, to accept your ways. Let's just submit to what God says to do. You can also learn, don't forget God's word. Always remember, never forget. Like Jesus, is, the, the great things that Jesus did back 2,000 years ago, let us in this generation never forget. Let us not murmur and complain, but trust in God's ways. And lastly, believe with a full heart all of God's promises and walk through this life faithfully. Like, let us trust in His ways and believe Him. So in lesson two, we're going to get to talk about more of this chapter and how God had compassion. Now after, after all of the things that they had done against him, God was long-suffering with them. He did not destroy him, but was long-suffering and patient with them. And we're going to see a lot of the love of God that he still had for this people, even though they were foolish and unbelieving. He, he was long-suffering with them, gave them time to repent. And he's doing the same thing for people today. <clears throat> So that's what God wants. He wants you to trust in Him. He wants you to follow Him. So if you are not a Christian today, you have to obey Christ's gospel. You have to do what Jesus said. Take Jesus' way to get to heaven. Here's how you do it. you got to hear what the instructions are in the first place. That makes sense. But secondly, you have to believe. You have to believe in, in this path that Jesus is the only way back to the Father. He is the Son of God. I have to believe that. But then I have to repent of my sin. That means I'm going to turn away, make that decision in my mind. I'm not going to live that way anymore. Breaking God's laws, continue it. I'm going to repent. Jesus says, unless you repent, you'll all like my care. Glad and then confess him before men. Make that vocal confession. I do believe. That's a continual thing. I do believe. Make a life of life. Jesus is the Son of God. And then lastly, be baptized, immersed in water, to be forgiven of your sin, washed away. Rising up to walk in newness of life, and then the faithful unto death. Be faithful to our God. If anybody has any need to come and respond to the gospel's invitation today, it's offered now as we stand and we'll sing.